So let's start. Hello and welcome to one in a series of talks on religious and cultural Armenian heritage. Tonight we welcome Christina Maranzi, who's Arthur H. Dadian and Ara Ostemel, Professor of Armenian Art and Architecture and Chair of the Department of the History of Art and Architecture at Tufts University. Christina will be giving a talk entitled At Risk, the Medieval Armenian Churches and Monasteries of Artsakh. Before we start, if I could ask you to make sure you're on mute, I need to let you know also that this session will be recorded and made available on the Diocese of the Armenian Church in the United Kingdom and Ireland website. Christina is the author of three books and over 90 articles and essays on medieval Armenian art and architecture, including most recently, An Introduction to Armenian Art published by Oxford Univer University Press. Her previous monograph called Vigilant Powers, Three Churches of Early Medieval Armenia on the Seventh Century Architecture of Armenia won both the Sona Aronian Prize for Best Armenian Studies Monograph from the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, and also the Karen Gould Prize for Art History from the Medieval Academy of America. Maranzi has worked on issues of cultural heritage for over a decade. Her campaign for the Cathedral of Moran near Ani resulted in its inclusion on the World Monuments Watch list for 2015-17. Christina, I'd like to hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Levon. Thank you to the Archbishop for having me and thank you everyone for coming and listening this evening. I would like to share my screen and, uh, and present. Um, Picture a large, beautiful, historic cathedral, a symbol of national importance, a sacred center of Christianity. Flames are rising from its roof and, new, and news headlines all over the world cover the tragedy blow by blow, publishing details and timelines of the damage and quoting experts on its renovation. Now picture another large, beautiful and historic cathedral, a landmark of national and religious importance. Bombs have just torn holes in, it, torn holes in its vaults, scattering debris all over the pews and the floor. Media outlets pay little attention. No headlines announce this event and very few among the public know that anything has happened. Of course, I contrast here the media responses to the 2019 fire at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris and the bombing on October 8, 2020 of the Holy Savior Kazan Shetsot's Cathedral located in the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenian Artsakh. Unlike the accidental fire, which broke out in the attics of the Paris Cathedral, Kazan Shetsots was deliberately targeted as part of a large scale military offensive by Azerbaijan on the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh, a war which began in September, 2020. Should the destruction of one religious monument receive so much attention and the other so little? In historic preservation, you might say that celebrity counts. Everyone has heard of Notre Dame or San Marco in Venice, the Hagia Sophia, Sagrada Familia or Milan Cathedral. But how many have heard of the Gazanchetsots Cathedral and why should they? Who gets to decide what monuments are famous and what does fame have to do with survival? Some might argue that a monument earns fame by its beauty, antiquity, impressive size, complex technology, and its religious and historical significance. After all, Notre Dame is a landmark of high Gothic architecture with its soaring interior spaces, flying buttresses and pointed ribbed vaults. Stained glass adorns its windows and a vast sculptural program appears on its facades and portals. It lies in the center of the Ile de la Cité 
in one of Europe's major capitals and serves as the seat of the Archbishop of Paris. About 5,000 kilometers southeast of Paris, the argument for such exceptionalism loses force. The recently bombed Cathedral of Kazanchet Sotz is a modern masterpiece completed in 1887, sheathed in stone, capped with tall umbrella roofs, and ornament, ornamented with crosses, angels, and other sculptures. It is a beautifully coherent synthesis of age-old Armenian building traditions. Rising some 115 feet from its base to the tip of its cupola, it is also one of the largest Armenian churches in the world. So why should the public care about the monuments of Artsakh? That's something I think about a lot as an art historian. And I think there's a relationship between the fame of a building, it's the way it's celebrated in scholarship and by the public and the potential or the promise of its preservation for posterity. I made up a little chart here that might be, that reflects some of the relationships I think are happening in, in um, art history. And I would start at the top with specialist scholarship. That is people like me who work on monuments and do the very fine grained work on a building, whether it's studying its plan or its inscriptions or its sculpture, its historical context. When that work is done, the monument can be absorbed into general scholarship, survey books on art history, for example, that absorb the specialist scholarship and present it in a way that's more accessible. From those kinds of books, those big art history survey texts, it's possible for monuments to enter into a more public realm of consumption and to be mentioned in guidebooks or to be mentioned in public arts organizations or featured in museums. And from there, the public can become concerned and aware if a, if a monument or a tradition is at risk. From public concern, from things like families bringing the, the children to a museum, that can create student interest. And those students can become someday future scholars. This is a very rough and, and just speculative cycle of events, but I want to here stress the importance um, and interlinked uh, features of scholarship, uh, public awareness, and the fate of historical monuments. These things are all connected. So I'm gonna give you today an art historian's perspective on the situation of the monuments in Artsakh. And I want to, before I enter into Artsakh, I want to share with you something of my work in the region of Kars and Ani, that is in what we can call Eastern Turkey or what we might also call what Armenians would call Western Armenia. So uh, my story begins several years ago when I decided I wanted to write a book on Armenian church architecture, particularly Armenian church architecture of the seventh century. And the monuments of the seventh century are tremendously diverse and tremendously abundant. And I wanted to study them and understand them in detail. The one that you see on the lower left is the church that I was interested in studying and making a part of the book that I was planning to publish. And this is the Cathedral of Meren. Meren, as I mentioned, lies on the Turkish side of, um, of the closed border between Armenia and Turkey in a military zone. And so when I wrote to the Ministry of Culture and Tourism to get permission to visit this church, I was told that I had no, um, that I was not allowed to go. And this is the email that I re that I received. So in so this is where you can either stop as a scholar and decide, well, I just won't talk about that church because really, as an art historian, if you don't go to the site that you that you are talking about and writing about, you have no real authority. 
So my, my choice at that point, this was in 2010, was either to ignore Marin and just forget about it and work on something else. There are certainly lots of churches that are more accessible, but I realized that if I didn't study it, it wouldn't enter into that cycle that I was talking about before. That is the specialist schol scholarship and the generalist scholarship and that whole sort of kind of um, feedback loop of, of scholarship. Maren would not become a part of that. So it was important for me to push forward. And I decided that even if I never was able to get to the site, I would write about it. So that's what I did. And I studied every photograph I had like this one, I studied the inscription, which had been published, and I'm just showing you here <clears throat> what that looks like. Very important inscription with a lot of political, um, contemporary political details. I studied its sculpture, like this very, again, important sculpture on the south facade showing what we believe is the return of the true cross by the Emperor Heraclius to Jerusalem. I study all this without going to the monument. I studied its interior, its structure, more of its sculpture. I did everything I could, but then I got some very bad news. I was looking on the internet and found that in fact, the building that I had been studying so carefully from photographs was in fact not the most, up those were not the most updated photographs. That in fact, the entire south wall of Moran had collapsed. And this um, page was posted by Gagik Arzumanian who happened to go in 2009. So I learned from this that in fact, um, an entire wall covered by the way in inscriptions and sculpture was now lying on the ground. So that the progressive collapse of Marin from around 1900 to 2009 was really dramatic. And by the way, this church is a seventh century church. So it had stood for over a millennium, but between 1900 and 2009, was this progressive collapse, which is now seriously compromising the structure of the building. And just a shot again, one of Gagi Garzumanian's pictures. Shortly after that, I got the um, chance to go to Marin and I did. And so I'm just showing you the site on a Google map um, and the nearest village is here. Um, and I think the scale bar is here. So you can see that it's quite a walk up and up and down a valley through featureless landscape to the site of Marin. And uh, this is kind of what it feels like when you're going there and Marin is there in the distance. Um, I was, it was an incredible experience to go to the site. I was able not only to, to take photographs and um, to understand the church, but I was able to discover new frescoes and I've talked about this many times, so I won't, I won't bore you with it too much, but I wanted to show you what that means. So here's the interior apse of Marin, the sanctuary of Marin, and, um, and this is what I was able to do with it. So it had an entire fresco program of Christ and apostles, as well as a, an inscription above um, from the Psalms. And I was able to use this, um, the technology that I used to uncover this, this apps program and did the same thing at Ani Cathedral. So I'll just show you briefly what that looks like. So this is a tiny detail of Ani Cathedral and then through software, you can sharpen it up and you get this wonderful um, bowl that forms part of a throne of Christ. Um, and then one last image I'll show you from Ani Cathedral, which is a newly discovered inscription in the in the apps that I was also able to uncover using software. So in a way, the the disappointment of not seeing Moran at the beginning forced me to to study it, so that when I did see it, I was prepared and I was able to to discover new things. And since then, I've been able to go back many times. We'll continue. We'll we'll return to Moran at the end of this presentation. But now I want to turn to the region at hand, and that is the region of Artsakh, and talk about the monuments there and why they're important and how they can be protected and how they can be studied. So um, I'm showing you a map of um, Artsakh the, uh, the and the surrounding areas and Armenia, and you see here a list of some of the major monuments 
of Artsakh. And when I say major monuments, these have received the most attention by scholars. But I think it's important to point out that while the study of Armenian architecture could fill libraries, the study of Artsakh is a much smaller, smaller fraction. So there isn't at all anything like the, the study of the monuments of medieval Artsakh that we have, for example, in Ani, or we have at Etchmiadzin, or we have um, in Sunik. This is really an area that is still in need of careful study. And that's also one of the tragedies of the current situation that we, we are not, that the buildings are not accessible for, for scholars to work with. So this is a map and these are nine monuments that are important, but, and here's the, here's an outline of the region I'm talking about, but we could fill, um, we could fill uh, a map with all these points and um, talk about even 4,041 sites um, that, that stud the region of Artsakh. And when we talk about monuments, we're talking about not just buildings, but painted programs, inscriptions, sculpture. And of course, alongside that, we're talking about history, identity, and spirituality. So it's, it's much more than just masonry walls that is at risk. When we talk about the abundance of monuments. I just want to illustrate that for you a little bit. So here you see the uh, Western province of Kachatakh that was handed over to Azerbaijan. And you can see here, this is, so this is just a, a region, a region of Artsakh and you can see here the many monuments that, um, that appear on this map. Or you can put it in a Word document form and you can see them this way. But either way, you can see that we're talking about is a tremendous volume, a tremendous inventory of monuments. For each one of these, scholars have questions. So let's take one of the more famous ones. This is Tsitserna Vank, a fifth or sixth century basilica, um, which is in the Khashatak or Lachin region. This is a rare thing for architecture across the world. It's an early Christian basilica. And whether we're talking about Rome or whether we're talking about Jerusalem or Constantinople or wherever, early Christian basilicas that are intact are rarities. So this is really an important monument for the history of architecture, period. Tsitsernavank is a three-aisle basilica with um, side chambers at the eastern end. Um, it is similar in its form to basilicas in Armenia and the Republic of Armenia, like this one. And um, even, even in terms of the placement of the windows. But it's very interesting for one element and I, I just wanna share this with you uh, because it's, it will give you a sense of, of um, one of the things that needs to be studied uh, regarding this monument. And that is above the apse, there is a gallery. So you enter the church and the apse is, is here, uh, but above it is a gallery. And that's really unusual in the context of ecclesiastical architecture. It's unusual from an architectural perspective, but if you think about it theologically, who would be who would be appropriate to stand in an area just above where the Eucharist is performed? So theologically, architecturally, this is an element exceptionnel, sorry for the typo, um, in, as according to Thierry and Donna Bedian. Um, so much in need of study. The problem is if a monument like this is tampered with um, and, and uh, you know, at worst vandalized, then it makes this the study of this kind of feature all the more difficult. So I wanna stress here that, that at risk here is not just treasures um, for, for the Armenian people, but it's also um, problems and issues within the study of Armenian architecture and indeed medieval architecture um, that are potentially going to, we're going to lose the opportunity to, to study them and 
that work, that specialist scholarship work belongs in that cycle that I showed you before um, of, uh, of communities talking to each other so that if we, if we can't do the work on this monument, if we can't find out about something as specific as this, um, as this gallery over the Eastern Apps, that has an effect ultimately on how much the public will care about the monument. And um, just, to, just to kind of highlight this further, one of the few uh, Western language books that talks about Tsitsiana Avank um, by Anna Gret plontke um also stresses the importance of doing new investigations on the church of Tsitsiana Avank. So a new investigation with probes could provide further information on the complicated history of the monastery church of Tsitsiana Avank. Now this was written in 2007. Will we have the opportunity to, um, to do that work? Will that happen? That's the question that, that is at stake. I want to show you um, another monument and take you now to Karvajar district, which is north of Kashata and look at this, um, the famous monument of Dadivank. And I've just highlighted it for you here. Um, a monument that's been much in the news that's in the hands of the Russian peacekeepers. And it's been um, in the news and photographed widely, but it's also important to understand it from a medieval architectural and history point of view. Um, Dadivank is a rarity in the sense that it preserves many, not just the church building, but many monastic um, structures alongside it, which means that by studying Dadivank, we can have a sense of the life, the fabric of, mon of a monastic daily life. We have refectories, we have kitchens, we have various kinds of, um, of buildings, functional buildings, utilitarian buildings that can help us understand monastic life. So that's, that's one of the reasons that this is important. And also, of course, Dadivank is a an archive or a kind of library of inscriptions. If these are lost as they were at Mren, um, then we lose a chapter of first-hand history about the site. Unlike manuscripts, which can be, are often preserved because they're copied over and over again. Sometimes the originals are lost, but we have those copies. Inscriptions are contemporary, immediate first-person witnesses to history. And so it's imperative that they, um, that they are preserved. And then often what historians will do will cross check that information against men and against other kinds of evidence. That's tremendously important. Um, and they're also aesthetic. They're also part of the aesthetic of, aesthetic of the building. And as, as um, Armenian uh, scholars of Armenian art and writing know, um, inscriptions form a kind of crucial aspect to Armenian art, whether it's a textile that's inscribed or whether it's a building or whether it's a ceramic, inscriptions are uh, often in beautifully calligraphic writing form part of the visual appearance and the beauty of uh, Armenian art and architecture. And Dadivank is no exception. But in addition to that, the, the church is also painted. And I'm showing you here details uh, recently restored uh, um, from the recently restored program at Dazivank showing the Virgin on the right, you can see, um, and on the left in the inset, an image of Christ. So this again is a uh, program that is in need of further study. There are very interesting connections here with Byzantine art, uh, with other um, other traditions of Armenian art and Armenian manuscript painting, and the for me again the 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 possibility that these could be lost to scholars would impoverish the history of art. We can walk around the monastery and witness various treasures, whether it's this sculpted portal at the end of a gallery that shows evidence for um, connections with Armenian art farther to the north and west, with trends in Islamic art, trends in Georgian art. Dadivank is important because it shows these connections 
in the 13th and 14th centuries that were happening across Armenian and neighboring lands where artists and architects were looking at each other's work and almost, I think, competing with each other to, to create these fantastic designs. Dadivank also has important figural sculpture like the inscriptions, these are, these are contemporary testimonies to historical individuals. And here you see two of the patrons holding between them um, a model of the church. These kinds of miniature model, model churches were, are frequently found in Armenian monastic architecture and are really interesting because they aren't just generic you know, sort of buildings. They're actually meant to be portraits of the church itself. Um, so there are, and th there are many different donation scenes on the church showing figures with church models. So this is really a, a kind of a, an extraordinary monument and complex for, for, for those reasons too. Uh, I just wanna show you a few more slides of the, the, the structure. Here I'm using line drawings that were published by the RAA, very important organization I'll, I'll talk about again at the end showing you portals and inscriptions, transcribed inscriptions um, on the walls of Dadivank. A few images from um, my own trip to Artsakh, which was now uh, many years ago, 2000, I think 2001. Um, but I, I, for all those who have gone, it is an unforgettable experience. Um, and then the Khachkars. And that takes me to another sort of dimension of what I wanna talk about today that we're not talking about just uh, monuments and monastic complexes, but also a, um, a corpus of kachkars or carved stone crosses. As, as this audience well knows, kachkars are um, a kind of hallmark of Armenian artistic tradition. They are inscribed as intangible heritage. Uh, kachkar carving is inscribed as intangible heritage um, for Armenia under UNESCO. And the examples we see in Artsakh are extraordinary and some of the earliest that we have. These two examples of Khachkars are from Dadivank, but there are many others all over uh, the region. And my favorite, my personal favorite, is that um, of Handabert in that northern province of Karvajar. And here you see Haik um, Rarhok uh, Khacharian, who shared with me this photograph, and I'm very um, grateful to him for that. But it's a it's it's Hawk um, measuring a, a khachkar that's embedded in the wall in um, the monastery of Handabert. And this is, um, this is a sort of far view, but then a closer view shows that it is, it bears the typical cross, the Latin cross, which is shown um, with kind of leafy ends and grapes and all the kind of traditional vocabulary of Armenian khachkar carving. But at the very bottom, there's a figure of a, a breastfeeding woman uh, with a child. And let me show you this more carefully. So there's scholarly debate over what is shown here. I am inclined to agree with Hamlet Petrosyan, uh, that who is the eminent scholar of Khachkars, that this is a scene of a breastfeeding mother with her deceased child. But it's also, um, it, it's to me, it is, it's quite possible that when monks looked at this image, they would have also been reminded of the breastfeeder par excellence, that is the virgin. And so this is something that takes us to the literary world of Shara Khans, um, where Armenians sing during the Feast of Theophany um, of the Virgin who provided her virginal holy milk to drink and Christ who was fed like a babe from the breasts of the Virgin out of his love for mankind. Rigor Naragatsi also um, talked, the important 10th century Armenian mystic talks about the Virgin um, alone, who alone shall be on the pure lips of happy tongues. And he says, indeed, if but a drop of your virgin milk were to rain on me, it would give me life. So there's a whole uh, tradition in the Armenian church of, um, of, uh, of um, the virgin as breastfeeder. And, and I think this was perhaps in the minds of the monks when they looked at this unusual image of the Virgin. 
and uh, an, an unusual image of the, the mother of God. No, this unusual image of the mother, a mother and her child. So where does this leave us? We have all this interesting evidence and all this, this potential for further work. Um, we've seen a, a basilica with a gallery over its eastern apse. We've seen a monastery with an unusually, uh, unusual, unusually preserved complex of, um, of buildings around it, telling us something about the medieval life of, of, um, of the Armenian monk. We've seen a khachkar with an extraordinary um, iconographic element of a breastfeeding mother and you can multiply that in the thousands. But as we know, all of this material is under threat. And as Simone discussed so eloquently in the previous lecture, um, the, the Armenian monuments that are in um, Azerbaijani hands um, have suffered. So last time Simone showed Nakhchivan and what's happened to the Armenian monuments there. And we can also see the same thing ha that has happened in the region of Artsakh, whether it's the defacing of inscriptions. Now, um, of course, the erasure of entire churches, if you saw that recent BBC report. Um, there was also in the 1990s widespread destruction of Armenian monuments. Um, and there's the really gruesome example of a school uh, that was um, made in, um, that was constructed actually prior to that in the 1950s that is made entirely of um, Armenian spolia, fragments of tombstones, fragments of inscriptions um, and sculpture. What you're looking at here is a plan of, of the school, and these are the classrooms, but all the numbers indicate places um, where the scholars found fragments of Armenian, broken up Armenian sculpture, tombstones, inscriptions. And here you see these carefully photographed, again, by the, re the RAA research on Armenian architecture, um, and just some details from, from that school. I can't imagine what it would have been like. Um, it's now abandoned, but what it would have been like to learn in a place that held those kinds of memories. But, um, but that gives us a sense of a precedent for what what can happen to Armenian um, religious culture and material culture in, uh, in Artsakh. So what next? What, what, what happens next? I think that's of course a big question. Um, so with that, I want to skip a few slides and um, talk about what, what I've learned from working at Moren and, um, and Ani and that is that it is possible to intervene. And I want to, to show you a little bit of the kind of work that's, that's happening now at ANI and what the work we did at Moren to give you a sense of that promise. Um, I'm an optimistic person, probably naively so, but I've also seen really good work by well-meaning people um, who have come together to try to protect Armenian monuments. And this is uh, a, a church, the church of Surpurgic um, in Ani. And you see it here with interior scaffolding. You see some of the people that I, the, the, some of the plans that were made, very careful plans of this incredibly complicated monument that's 19 sides covered in frescoes and yet is half, um, half of a monument, as you can see. Um, with Mren, uh, I was lucky enough to successfully list that site with the World Monuments Watch in 2016. And with that came money and expertise and organized work. And so I'll just go back to that in a minute. So that it was um, with the State Department that we were able to achieve laser scanning of the monument. So, so that that south facade, while that's gone, the remainder was scanned and, um, and the entire site was scanned. 
So that was, that was done um, actually already in 2015, we did that work uh, and those, those records exist. And the hope was that when, um, when that was finished, we would move on to the next phase, which would be to stabilize the site. Unfortunately, that, um, that hasn't happened yet, but I am still hopeful that it could, but it's a race against time because the monument is in, uh, of course, worse condition than it was in 2015 because of the of gravity and um, because of the pull on the building. And now the asymmetrical um, situation of the building with the, la the collapse of the south facade. But, um, but having said that, the, I, I still think it's, it's possible to, to do organized work um, and the examples of Mren and Ani suggest to me pathways forward. There's another piece to the, all this, and it gets back to the question of art history again, and that is that no more in art history is it, is it acceptable not to address um, cultures that are outside the sort of hotspots of Europe and the Mediterranean. More and more art historians understand that they need to write inclusive art histories and art histories that involve regions and traditions like Armenia. And a wonderful example of this was the recent exhibition at the Metropolitan Mu Museum of Art um, of Armenian objects. And hopefully some of you got to go to that. So that um, that's, and, and of course the Met also issued a, um, a statement of concern about uh, or for the monuments in Artsakh. So there are people, increasingly people are, are thinking about Armenian art and its place in the history of art. And that can only help um, as we try to raise awareness about the plight of monuments in Artsakh. There's another thing that, um, that is positive, and that is that we, are, that we are talking about, when we talk about the Armenian tradition, what we're talking about is centuries of commemoration, documentation, and scholarship. Whether I'm talking about manuscript colophons, like the one at the upper left, um, and of course that's a staple of medieval Armenian manuscripts, the idea that the scribe should record his name and the date of the, um, of the work and the circumstances under which it was made. But then um, we also have 19th century antiquarian descriptions of monuments um, and engravings like the one below on the right. Um, we have corpora of inscriptions that have been carefully inscribed and, and uh, tra carefully transcribed. And what you see um, up here is actually Ganzasar, the interior of Ganzasar, um, this big foundation inscription on the interior wall with the window um, in the center. So there's a whole volume dedicated to the inscriptions of Artsakh. And then we have the research on Armenian architecture, that organization I told you about before that has been recording all of the Armenian monuments in Artsakh and all around and also recording destruction. Alongside that, there's all the Soviet scholarship as well. So there is this, this tremendous, um, tremendous habit, if you like, of commemoration and documentation and scholarship that, that we see in the Armenian tradition. Um, and that can be traced back, if you wanna think of it as a continuum, it can be traced back to the Middle Ages. This is ongoing. And I am honored to be a part of this, um, to part of this effort. And right now, my students um, at Tufts, I have a seminar and we are studying liturgical textiles, um, Armenian liturgical textiles, and we're gonna have a small show um, in the fall. And I wasn't surprised to find out that one of the textiles that we're studying is actually um, in a, was part of, or is now part of the region of Azerbaijan, but which was historically Armenian territory. And this is a site um, called Vorduar, um, and it's presently in Nakhchivan. But what 
what you see here is a, um, a textile that is from, it, it, it names itself and you can see there are two inscriptions. There's one just at the base and then there's really, it's really hard to read one below, but it tells it that it's from the monastery or the church of Serb Stepanos in Drunis or Durnis. And so I think this is, um, this is that site in Vorduar from a church called Serb Stepanos. So you can't, in a way, I think um, you, can, you can destroy the church, but what you can't destroy is the memory. And there are, this is one textile and there are such objects, textiles, manuscripts, liturgical objects in collections all over the world. And I think the more we look, we're going more, more, the more we're going to recover this kind of um, object. So I, with that, I would like to um, stop my, my PowerPoint and I'd be glad to take questions from the audience. Okay, thank you so much, Christina for this beautiful talk and also for the important and inspiring work that you do. Uh, indeed, we now have time for some questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. It's usually the raise hand button is usually located under the reactions on Zoom, or you could uh, send a note through chat that you'd like to ask a question or just type your question in the chat. So with that, I'll see if anyone wants to go ahead. Okay. Please. Sorry, I <laughs> lost myself for a second there. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say, Dr. Christina, huge thank you for, for honoring us with your presence, really. I, I'd like to say uh, that it, it was an interesting talk, but it wasn't, it was spellbinding. Um, thank you. Thank you um, Pleasure. Absolutely sincerely. I've, I've been reading quite a few of your articles recently um, for obvious reasons that it's um, been an education and uh, I'd particularly like to thank you for making this subject so accessible and thanks I'd also like to say how your uh, your love and your passion comes through your work and, and is communicated to us um, so, so thank you again but but can I ask you a, a sort of well two two sort of questions really yes what, one um one, one would you agree really that, yeah. that we're sort of in awe of the actual people who actually built these monuments the, the the builders who built these churches and and uh other other um uh, artifacts other monuments yeah that <laughs> that these things have lasted for centuries yes. the workmanship yeah. right. must have been absolutely extraordinary and the knowledge of 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 the land that they were building on um, right it, it you know they've, they've lasted through neglect and earthquakes and uh, attack and, and so yeah. on um, yeah. and the second the second uh, question or the second part of the question um is how far were the um architects the actual builders of of these monuments if, as far as you know so thank you, my question. Could you ask the second one? What was, the, I didn't quite catch the whole thing. That How far the, we, we, we sort of know architects in the modern right. world to, to do the plans and do the drawing. Right, 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 and yes. Sort of do it. So yes. how far were the, the builders, the actual architects of what they were, they were building or were, were, was this, a, as we know it, a sort of two different disciplines? Oh, I see what you're, I think, okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, it is incredible when you think about the longevity of the buildings. Um, and there's, there are a variety of ways to think about that. And, but one of the most amazing things that I've noticed about Armenian buildings is the quality of the mortar. 
So, um, it, and you can see this particularly in, in, in the Ani Kars region where sometimes you'll have a building entirely stripped of its facing stones, but it's still standing and it's because the structure is rubble masonry. And so it has these beautifully cut revetment, revetment facing stones that are sandwiching a core of rubble and mortar. And so, um, but you know, in many cases, the, that the rubble mortar core is all that's left and it stands. Uh, which is which is extraordinary. So they were there. I think the kind of I'm not a I'm not a structural engineer, but that I want to use a term like tensile strength to to describe that. But um, but that is that's it. That's a really um, common thing that you see. And because of the ravages of time and because of the ravages of um, you know of vandals, you you can see that illustrated in many of the monuments. So I think that's part of it. I think also because the Armenian architectural tradition, um, I think there's a lot of evidence for empirical learning. So from, you know, you have a tremendous corpus of buildings, let's say in the seventh century and, and also some from the sixth, but you see, um, and earlier, but you see, I, if, it's, if, if the Armenian architects were working like medieval architects in general, they were working in that empirical way. So if something falls down, you don't do that again. <laughs> so, and so you you see the that kind of observation. The observation of structure is re was really important. Um, so that's I think that's that's one thing. Um, and but that doesn't mean that the builders were conservative because then you see you know really extravagant buildings, um, particularly into the. 11th century into the 13th century, where they're almost kind of trying to challenge gravity, if you will. Um, what we know, we do know about the medieval architectural working practices, and we know this from a variety of sources. We know it from um, textual accounts. Um, we know it from inscriptions. We know it from from those those models um, that I that I showed you. Um, and there's a wonderful volume in Armenian on, on the architects and what they were doing. So interestingly, and I just, I'll stop with this, but interestingly, we usually associate the Renaissance as the period of sort of the, the yeah. star architect, you know, the great, the great planner who, you know, he comes up with the plan that then, you know, is used um, to build the great church. But, um, but in fact, what's interesting about the Armenian tradition is we actually do know a lot of names of architects like Terdat, who was interestingly chosen to repair the dome of the Hagia Sophia, according to an 11th century account, right? So there's, um, depending on where you look and how you look, you can find a lot of evidence for Armenian architects um, in, in the historical evidence. And it's very interesting. So I hope that that's helpful. Thank you for that. Okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one from Armenak Topalian. Can you comment on Aliyev's assertion that the churches were of Albanian origin, usurped by the Armenians? Is there any merit whatsoever in this argument? Um, so I listened to Simon's or Simon's presentation last time, and where he wondered even if the the um, Aliyev believes it himself, and I I'm not sure, but. Um, you know, I, I think that um, all the monuments that I have looked at uh, where there are Armenian inscriptions on them, um, I don't, I, I, I think, I don't want to ever assume a priori that a monument is one thing or the other, but I haven't really seen any evidence in the monuments that I've looked at for, um, you know, a specific Albanian origin, but I'm not sure what I would even be looking for, you know. So I don't, I'm, I'm speaking about these as Armenian sites um, because that's, there, there are inscriptions that are Armenian and because they, these buildings follow traditions that can be understood within the context of greater Armenia. So in Sunik or um, you know, farther to the, the Western North. But I, I understand why that um, 
argument is being deployed. It's very clear. And I also, I have to say, this is where you, when you get modern politicians starting to um, make pronouncements about medieval architecture, I start getting worried because they're just, this is where there needs to be actual more scholarship on these sites and monuments. So aside from whatever political um, argument you wanna push, it's, there has to, it, whatever you do, it has to be based on actual scholarship. And that's just not what I'm seeing coming out of Azerbaijan. I think if there were, then it would be, it, we would have a different kind of conversation. So. Um, just uh, because um, you mentioned scholarship, uh, there are other questions, but I may, if I may ask you, are you aware of other scholars, perhaps not of Armenian and not of Azeri origin, mm -hmm. who study these monuments in Artsakh? Yeah. Um, I'm thinking. I mean, the, the example I gave Annegret Plonka Luning, she's someone who, who, who does, who has worked on the monuments. And so she will, you know, divide them into a Caucasian Albanian, and she will claim that Tsitsiona Avank is Caucasian Albanian as opposed to Armenian. And, um, and the, it's not, to me, it's, it's like, it's not clear why. So, but, but I mean, that's again, sort of getting back to the previous question. Um, so there, there are people, but very few. Um, and I think that's going to change very fast because um, now we all know the stakes are so high. But, um, but thus far, very few people have, have worked on this material outside of um, Armenian and Azeri scholars. So it would be really good if, if, if more people did study it. And uh, I think that's, that's really got to happen it, along with everything else, because otherwise we're just, you know, we're speaking, but we're not speaking with really fine grain knowledge of the monuments. And I'm not talking just about documentation, which is great. I'm talking about actual historical study, which is something else, which is something that kind of weaves the monument into it's the fabric of who made it, why it was made, who was worshiping in it, you know, who were these people? And that's, that remains to be done. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question and a comment from Michel Gorgodian. Uh, thanks, Christina, for an amazing presentation and for the wonderful work you're accomplishing. Please, could you say more about Russian scholarship, which might help deter further distraction? I wish I could. That's a great question. And, uh, and I know there has been some, um, but I don't know what what scholars, if, and, and maybe other people in the audience know if there are scho Russian scholars now who are working on this. Um, I know there has been work in the past, but, um, but I'm not aware of anyone working now on the subject. So I'm sorry, that's not very, that's not very helpful maybe, but I would love to know if, if you know of anything being done. Particularly now that, you know, the, Russian peacekeepers are right there at Dadivank. So maybe one of them will turn into an art historian. Okay, there is a comment for Setrak Chilingarian. Uh, just a comment, no question, just an amazing study of our history. Thank you for preserving it with your work. And um, another question from uh, John Cohen. Thank you for an excellent presentation, Christina. I have a question. What is UNESCO's position on the preservation of the sites you have studied? Right. Is there an international consensus on, this, on the historical significance of these sites? Right, so um, I, yeah. So I think Simon or Simon might be on this call and he might answer this better, but as far as I'm concerned, um, they have they have raised concerns about uh, I think they call it Armenian heritage in Artsakh, but there is no uh, there is nothing more than that. They have tried to enter, they've tried to go and 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 you know monitor or at least see what's going on in Artsakh and haven't been allowed in. 
and I think that's where things stand. Although I, I maybe there's an update. Um, but so that there is, there's my sense is there's generalized concern, but nothing, um, there's nothing more specific um, being done. But that's UNESCO, and UNESCO is, of course, a large, slow moving body. And um, another thing, though, if I could just add, is that there are at least two applications being made to the World Monuments Fund right now for the for Artsakh. So, um, so World Monuments Fund, as opposed to UNESCO, is 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 more um, results focused, and so they go in with a specific um, idea of making a change to a monument, maybe um, stabilizing it or documenting it or something. So they work much faster. They have a two-year window they give themselves for getting something done, and um, and two of the two two sites are currently up for um, for consideration for the watch list, which is what it's called. But UNESCO, um, I have, I don't think anything's happening there. Okay, um, I noticed that Simon Marakan is. Uh, attending this talk. So I just want to check if he has a comment to add. But I also don't want to put you on the spot, Simon. So Hi, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm driving. But uh, very quickly, um, U UNESCO uh, had a word of uh, uh, word of words with, with Azerbaijan. As, uh, as uh, Dr. Maranzi mentioned, they he requested access, Azerbaijan said no, and then Azerbaijan decided to, to manipulate the relationship and say, sure, actually you are welcome here, but only for the purpose of assessing damage that Armenian occupation has done to Islamic cultural monuments. So uh, they're trying to keep the engagement door open, but for, for manipulated purposes, and we'll, we'll see um, where, where the relationship goes. But, but as Dr. Maranzi said, you know, UNESCO is a body of uh, a, a state actors who often use UNESCO as a forum. Uh, so it's not an all powerful uh, organization, as I, and I, as I mentioned during my own presentation, probably the, the ideal way would be for a UN Security Council resolution that mandates yeah. um, UNESCO access to Azerbaijan for monitoring Armenian churches. And that's obviously a far uh, fetched hope, uh, but, but that seems to be the, the ideal scenario that, that some, of, some of us are considering of pursuing, and we'll see where that goes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Simon. Okay, uh, thank you, Simon. We have uh, the next question, which is from Felix Corley. Uh, buildings are not too difficult to date. How can an inscription be dated with any accuracy if it has no date on it? Yeah. Well, many of the inscriptions that we find on Armenian monuments, and in fact, on Armenian objects in general, do have dates. This is one of the wonderful things about them. So it is a convention, for example, when you make a donation to a church to record your name and to record the date, whether it's in the Armenian era or whatever. So that's um, useful. When you don't have a date, um, you can still date it by means of um, the language that's used and by the paleography that's used or sometimes where it is on the building. Um, so there are various uh, tools that scholars use to, to date inscriptions. Um, or at least to provide some kind of window for possibility, you know, that this could, this is, you know, a 13th century inscription, for example, looks very different from a 7th century inscription. And an 18th century inscription looks very different from both of those, so. Okay, thank you. And we have another question. How many churches, monuments, are there now under Azerbaijani control, now after recent war, and what kind of fears do you have? Can you speak a bit about Tigrana Kert? Sure. Um, yeah. So I'm. I. I can only imagine, and ba you know, it's hard to it's hard to enumerate, but um, I would think if you count every Khachkar, you're talking about thousands. You know, if you're if you're if you're going to to go by Khach, you know, each Khachkar. Um, in terms of complexes and monuments, I would think you know it's more in the hundreds, but it's a lot. We're talking about a, you know, a very robust corpus. Um, Tigrana Kert is, is fascinating. I didn't, I didn't raise the the um, issue in this in this talk, but um, it was. I don't know its status right now, but it was an archaeological site of huge importance, not just as a Hellenistic city, 
named after the great Tigran, the great, the um, Tigran Metz, but, um, but also because it, it was an early Christian site. And so it shows the um, something very interesting from the point of view of late antiquity, which is a, um, the, the kind of afterlife of a, of a pagan site in the Christian period. And as an early Christian site, it shows many interesting features that Hamlet Petrosian as the excavator of the site has revealed. Um, so he, uh, he, is, he has uncovered the basilica and showed some really interesting features that he um, that he's he's made a lot of really interesting arguments and I think that that most of his stuff is published online but but I think it's that that um, the layering of the pre-Christian and the Christian at Tigrana Kerk, which is really the most fascinating thing, plus the finds that that have that were recovered. Now again, what the status of the site is now, I. I couldn't tell you, but um, but I know there's there's concern, and I know that the dig house or the the kind of the shelter that was there on site was vandalized uh, from photographs one can see online. So. Okay, uh, thank you. So we have a couple of thank you comments. One from Dr. Grigorian, thank you very much, with an Armenian flag, and uh, from Sister Demiana who says Axios, Axios, Axios for your love and enthusiasm in researching and presenting this very noteworthy topic. More pictures of yours and others on these holy ancient churches and monasteries. Um, I don't see uh, any other questions in the chat. And I think we, oh yes, I see a physical hand raised by Aram Melkonian. Go ahead, please. I, do I need to unmute you? No. You need to unmute yourself, I think. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Christina, for your talk. Uh, it was very interesting, of course. I just wanted to ask, actually, um, do we have any names of the architects and masons or builders of any of the churches at all? Oh, okay. That's a great question. Um, a little bit I like- hope not I, Albanian. I, I hope they're not Albanian names. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, I see where you're going with that. Okay. Um, just because I don't know the names doesn't mean they're not out there and I would not put any money on their, their I, I, I feel pretty confident just knowing what I do from greater, you know, from our traditions West and uh, um, that, yeah, we probably do have some names somewhere and they might be in building inscriptions and they, but they might be in chronicles. And the other thing I'll say too, and this gets to Anna's question, is about Mason's marks, which are also very interesting. And these appear regularly on Armenian churches. So these are marks, you see these also sometimes in, in European architecture or even in Byzantine architecture. They're marks that Masons make on the buildings um, and on each stone. And so this is very common in Armenian architecture um, and is used uh, to often to trace, of course, we don't precisely know how they worked, what they were. Were they the names? Were they were they, did they have to do with the payment of each mason? We don't know, but but they can help us to um, to to kind of group monuments. So that's something that actually I don't think has been done yet for Artsakh. I could be wrong, but um, but that would be something to look at to study the masons' marks on the building. So so lots of work that, yes, that should be you. done. Yeah, just one more thing. Yeah. Uh, I do have. This book here, I don't know whether you can see, is written by Murad Hasratyan, early Christian architecture of Armenia. Have you ever come Wonderful. across that? Yeah, Wonderful. it's got a lot, of, a lot of uh, churches there, you know, and, and it's got the sort of plans of them as well and excellent. so on. So That's just out of interest, <laughs> I thought That's I'd show you Wonderful. That. No, I don't have that book, but I, 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 I know the scholar, of course. You do. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. This yeah. book was a uh, 2000, year 2000. Yeah. Excellent. Anyway, thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you all. So I'm sorry. I um, 
I, there is one more question. So if you don't mind, um, Not at all. Uh, let's have that one more question and then I'll hand it over. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. So uh, Stephanie Stepanian asking, thank you for this interesting talk. You mentioned some unique elements in the medieval Armenian architecture. Can you see a continuum in the evolution of the architecture when compared to modern Armenian buildings? Yeah, so I mean, continuum is one word, revival might be another, it depends on how you see the history of architecture. Um, but for sure, if you look at modern Armenian buildings, you see um, connections to the past. We could see that with Ghazan Chetzotz, but you can see it when you go to Yerevan today. And what's so remarkable is that you see these buildings from the 20s and 30s and 40s, and they they um, clearly sort of quote from medieval Armenian architecture. So um, whether it's the, um, is it the Marriott, is it a Marriott hotel? The one, you know, the, the, the one in um, Republic Square that uses ideas from Ani Cathedral and Akhtamar or whether it is the opera house um, where you can see ideas uh, from other medieval Armenian churches. And then the Zvartnots International Airport, which is an international airport that's named after a seventh century church. Now, how many airports can you say are named after a seventh century church? So I think whether it's in name um, or whether it's in the sculpt sculptural features, overall profile, there is certainly this kind of um, strong sense of, uh, of um, our, how Armenian forms, decorative forms, um, and structural forms connect with the past. And I think that's, that actually makes modern Armenian architecture really interesting to study because it is modern, but at the same time, it's very clearly connected to a historical tradition. Okay, well, thank you again, Christina, for this very special and really well put together talk that I personally le learned a lot. And Thank I'm sure so many the audience would uh, share that opinion. So before I hand it over to Bishop Hovakim, I, I would just like to say that uh, this was a this was one talk in a series of talks on religious and cultural Armenian heritage, and uh, the next talk will be on the 12th of May with Raj Chilingarian, speaking on Christianity in Karabakh: the rich religious heritage in Artsakh from 4th to 21st century. And following that, we'll have Jasmine Damdragut on May 26th, uh, giving a talk entitled Definitely Endangered Armenian Language as Intangible Cultural Heritage of Artsakh. So with that, I'd like to hand it uh, to Bishop Hovakim. Thank you, Levon. Thank you for facilitating. Before coming to thank Christina for this wonderful Presentation, I have to my, uh, both my brothers in Christ, Bishop Christopher here of Coventry and Archbishop Angelus who are present at this presentation. And when Cathedral in Shushi was bombed, I remember that Christmas after that, a few months after, His Grace Bishop Christopher gave a speech, actually a wonderful speech and invited his, his people to pray for Armenians in Artsakh. It was very touching and we were moved actually. And in fact, Coventry Cathedral was bombed during the Second World War by Nazi forces actually. And I think there is a similarity of feeling and so on. Your Grace, if you would like to say a few words, I mean, to our people, sorry, just putting on the spot this. And also when you finish Your Grace, Archbishop Angelus is here and now, in the Middle East, actually, churches are being bombed, uh, Christians are being persecuted. Maybe you can also say a few words, actually, to our people. And we are a joint group, Armenians and different. We are humans who have come here, who have concern about cultural preservation, our heritage, heritage protection. And these belong to humanity, not to Armenians alone, actually. Your Grace. Thank you. Thank you, Your Grace, for your kind words. And uh, dear um, brothers and sisters, it's a, a real privilege uh, to, to be with you and to enjoy this wonderful le lecture. Um, I, I was deeply moved and troubled when I saw the um, 
uh, the evidence of the bombing of Shusi, Shusi Cathedral. Um, as his grace says, I, I, I'm Bishop of Coventry and our cathedral was destroyed in, in 1940. Uh, and, and we still, we, we still bear that uh, pain. Um, uh, and it was um, not, not rebuilt. The ruins were left as the ruins, but uh, a new cathedral was built out of the ruins. And we call one the Cathedral of Crucifixion and the other the Cathedral of, um, of um, Resurrection. And uh, it will be my very great pleasure to um, welcome uh, Your Grace, uh, Bishop Hovakim uh, and other friends uh, to the Cathedral, Coventry Cathedral, as we commemorate the um, uh, the Armenian Massacre of 1915. So that will be a great privilege to welcome you. Um, Coventry, uh, following the, the bombing, um, uh, it developed a, a, a Ministry of Reconciliation, trying to um, uh, um, turn this uh, uh, terrible um, event of war and bombing of the cathedral uh, into, well, to, to, to see it redeemed uh, by the story of the cross and the resurrection. And I do wear uh, the Coventry uh, Cross of Nails, um, which uh, um, was uh, first put together by a priest the morning after the bombing. He saw uh, nails uh, lying on the rubble in the shape of a cross. And he thought, um, well, that's, that, 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 that tells the story that we want to tell to the world. Um, and Bishop um, Hobakim, um, uh, we're very honoured that in Coventry that Archbishop Angelos wears that cross himself. Um, I'm sure not all the time, Archbishop, you probably have a number of crosses, but you are wearing it today. Well, that's really wonderful. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, it's my a great honour to be uh, in your presence as well as Bishop Hovakim, so your eminence. Thank you. Thank you, Your Grace. Your eminence, please. Thank you, Your Grace. And firstly, I must give my sincere apologies. I wasn't here from the beginning, but um, we have a, a family um, that was very, very uh, suddenly bereaved this morning. And so I was with them. Um, uh, so uh, thank you for your, for your patience. Um, I think when we look at what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Armenia and, and, and the Karabakh region, it resonates so much with the story of Christianity from the very beginning of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, our own church that has, um, that has experienced persecution for 2000 years with St. Mark, the founder of the church being the first martyr. And also with, um, with Coventry Cathedral and our sisters and brothers in the West who have also experienced that pain. So as I've always said, there, there is, absolutely no monopoly on pain. Um, I think we've all experienced it. And I think we must all stand together. And this is why at any opportunity, I, I am honored and blessed to stand with my brother, uh, Bishop Hovakim, whom I've known for, for many, many years. And uh, Bishop Christopher, who I've also known for many years is a dear respected brother and with all of you. And it's not just because we're Christians, but I think because we're Christians, we must do two things. First is we must live the reality of the body of Christ in which we are all members and we all feel each other's joys and pains. But also as witnesses to the truth, as witnesses to the freedom that God has created us in, and as witnesses to the sovereignty and dignity of life that God has created in each and every one of us. We have a responsibility to do that for Christians and non-Christians alike. But now that it falls on Christians, and we know, according to many, many polls and many, many surveys, including the Bishop of Truro's report on persecution of Christians, that 80% of religiously motivated persecution around the world falls on Christians. And so that should take a proportionate part of our time and our attention and our focus. I'm very thankful to what Bishop Christopher does in the House of Lords and in the House of Bishops. Uh, I'm very thankful for the incredible witness that Bishop Hovakim has for his own community 
and always standing by our side whenever we have anything, whether it's for our church or we can do together. So it's a great honor and a blessing to be with you. And um, I also look forward to accompanying, I don't know Bishop Christopher if you know or not, but I'm looking forward to accompanying Bishop Hovakim when he comes up to see you. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. God willing, I'll be there on that day. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Your Eminence. And Christina, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for the wonderful work you have, you have been doing. You are helping. I mean, this, this is a blessing, actually. We have this communication, this technology. Even though it's a lockdown, we can't meet in person, but this is one of the advantages that we can meet and have this wonderful presentation. And thank you for finding time. And also, I know you are extremely busy, but you agreed for this presentation. Thank you. God bless you. And I think this is the first. Our people love you. And I think this is not the last one. Good. And a lot of friends have sent great things. Later, I'll email you the names. Thank you. So, thank you. God bless you. Now, as we are coming to the end, maybe your grace. Just I will ask that on April 24th at 4 o'clock, we will have ecumenical prayer service in remembering Armenian genocide and His Grace Archbishop Bishop Christopher is hosting our service this year. This is symbolic. With some of the community members, we will go there and we also streamed. Those of you who cannot attend in person, you can follow. We will share the links. And concluding this, maybe I ask Bishop Christopher, you bless us with your prayer. Bless, give us your blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, we pray for all the holy sites and holy objects that we've been hearing about this evening. We pray for your protection. We pray for your mercy. We pray for all those who seek to save this heritage. We pray for scholars, for all those in public and religious life, who work for the preservation of these places and objects and for the purposes of peace. And we pray now, most holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, that you will send down your holy blessing upon all those who seek the ways of peace. We pray for the Armenian Church in all its places. And we pray especially for the faithful in Aksak. And we ask your blessing upon us now. The blessing of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Your Grace. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Great honor. Thank you. Christina, but we want this to, re to be repeated again, this presentation. Or maybe about the Granagert one day specifically. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's worth it's worth an evening. But in person, we invite you to come to London. I'm coming. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. Okay, okay. Great. Thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.